Halloween ears and welcome to another princess profile. I always forget the series exists and then I remember it does and then I get really excited because they're really fun videos to do and today is extra special because our princess is an honorary one, not a technical one. That's right friends, today we're talking about Lilo from Lilo and Stitch who's autistic as heck. But first, if you're new here, hi there, hello. My name is Sydney, my pronouns are they, them. I am an openly queer, disabled, autistic, trans, non-binary, actor, composer, educator, and disability advocate. It's getting easier to say as time goes on. I'm currently working on a thesis about disability, education, media, theater, performance, accessible education, basically anything else in any and all of those categories. It is culminating in the world's first all nerdy virgin cast and crew production of The Curious Incident of The Dog of the Nighttime. You can learn all about all that, the link's in my description. Also, ticket link is down there. If you are local to Mount Holyoke and want to come see my show, you should. They're free. Um, and I'm a white person in my early 20s with shoulder length light brown curly hair that's really messy right now. And I am wearing a navy yellow and green floral button up shirt because I wanted to get a Hawaiian shirt vibe and this is the closest thing I have to a Hawaiian shirt. I'm also sitting in front of a bookshelf. Now I have a series on my channel called Autistic Princess Profiles where we analyze Disney princesses through a neurodiverse lens so that we can see different types of autistic representation than your traditional cishet white boy who likes trains to try to humanize autism more for all of us and it's a really fun time or at least I think it is. Um, it's an excuse to watch Disney movies and call it work. If you want to know more about the all Disney princesses are autistic theory um, you can watch that video up here and also I have a playlist of all of those videos which is linked for you in the description and above somewhere probably during this video at some point as well. But as I said earlier today's video is special because we are not doing a technical Disney princess um, and also she is one of the most headcanoned autistic characters from Disney that I can possibly think of, at least in this moment. Now typically in this deep dives into Disney princesses, we will go through the Disney story, then the original story, and then what makes that character autistic. In this case, Lilo's original story is the one written by the director, Chris Sanders, which is the story in this. Also, for the record, um, Sanders is the voice of Stitch, which has to be one of my favorite fun facts that came up in research about this film. Um, but anyway, so the plan for today is to talk about the plot of the film, briefly go into why it's kind of a masterpiece, and then talk about what makes Lilo autistic as heck, why we love her for it, and what we can maybe learn from that. I will be fully honest, I got a lot of these points um, from the cinema therapy video about this film. Specifically in that video, they talked a lot about Lilo being autistic. I really appreciated that breakdown and I've linked it in the description for you below. But also, I did take issue with how certain things were phrased, particularly in saying person with autism and autism community rather than autistic person and autistic community as most of the community tends to prefer to be called, as well as regularly referring to Lilo as neurodivergent as a clear placeholder for the word autistic despite the word neurodivergent having a very different meaning. So just like friendly reminder to all people that the word autistic is a great one and you should use it when necessary. Don't just randomly do I just randomly use it? I don't know where I'm going with this. Anyway, I really appreciate the effort and the expert knowledge, so I have linked it down there below for you, and I'm saying that I did take some ideas from that, but I would have loved to, I don't know, have an autistic person involved in there to speak for the community, but it is what it is. Now you get this video. So let's talk about plot. The movie is plot-wise an experience. Like, it, you, you kind of have two things going on. The first thing is that some intergalactic situation is going on where a scientist gets in trouble for illegal experimentation, resulting in a little blue creature called Experiment 626 who then escapes before they get a chance to decide what to do with him. And he crash lands on Kauai, Hawaii. That rhymes. Um, and uh, two aliens? Are they aliens? I think they're aliens. Alien people. Alien things. The scientists who did the illegal stuff and the Grand Council's Earth expert um, go after 626 to try to get him back. Meanwhile, there's a 19-year-old Hawaiian girl named Nani who is trying to raise her younger sister Lilo, who's like six or seven, after their parents died in a car crash. Lilo is an adventure of a child, and in general, it's super difficult to parent a child at the age of 19, no matter what, but she's also quite the handful on her own. Social worker Cobra Bubbles is very concerned about Nani's ability to properly take care of and provide for Lilo, so the general conflict of the film is Nani trying to hold down a job to be able to keep Lilo. At the same time, Nani decides to let Lilo get a dog because Lilo has no friends, and the kid is very drawn to this weird blue and purple dog at the shelter that is most certainly not a dog, and she names him Stitch. And much like Lilo, he is a walking pile of chaos, but he's trying his best and we love him for that. They're the best of friends, it's great. Anyway, hi Jinx and Sue, we learn that there's no such thing as a perfect or correct family and they live their own unique version of happily ever after. The message of this movie and the execution of that message is just so detailed and genius and quirky and adorable and I love it and I saw it for the first time like 
gosh, two or three years ago, maybe, despite like, I grew up on this music and I can't explain why I've known it for years, but the movie's really great and it was a really wonderful experience. I cried very much. I also really love how all of the characters are imperfect and they're messy, but they're also trying their best. And Nani's friend who happens to be a boy is a dream boy, which I say is a lesbian, but he's kind of a dream boy. And even the villains of this film aren't really the bad guys. They're also human too, or alien too, I guess. Anyway, they did a really great job. Also, extra shout out to the fact that the creators really did their research. They deliberately tried to learn about the culture and wanted to represent Hula correctly. Also, many of the songs were traditional Hawaiian songs. There's discussion to be had about them combining two traditional Hawaiian songs to create uh, one that they could then uh, trademark. We're not gonna have that conversation right now. Um, and also the songs were performed by a real Hawaiian chanter and the Kamehameha School Children's Chorus, which is entirely indigenous Hawaiian kids, uh, which is all a low bar honestly. But anyway, obviously stories about Hawaiian culture written by two white dudes will never fully measure up. And I read as many message boards from native Hawaiians as I could possibly find because I have no right to be judging accuracy or whatever with this film. Um, but the general consensus that I could find was most people being like, well, it's way better than we could have expected. And they didn't totally hit the mark, but they definitely tried their best and it's better than a lot of other things. Um, and a lot of those things were very much mixed up in like the nostalgia of it, of what that rep meant to them as a young kid. So like, it's not perfect by any means, but it did touch on a lot of really hard parts of colonialism's impact on culture. And it truly did do its best, not to mention that the movie came out in 2002, which is back when extensive research and care being put into a movie was not really a common thing. And views of how we handle culture and media were also very different back then. I don't think that, well, we expected it to be really bad and it wasn't, so yay, we love it, is an actual endorsement of the film per se, but I also give that review for disability representation all the time. So I get it, um, especially for films that are older. Again, if there's other opinions from the community that I didn't find and didn't put in here, I'm sorry, but I tried, I tried my best and that's the general vibe that I was getting. Um, anyway, let's talk about autism. I also wrote a fun fact that this movie came out the day after I turned six months old. So if that makes you feel old, you're welcome. Anyway, Lilo has been widely picked up by the autistic community as a perfect representation of autistic childhood, reflecting the misunderstood walking tornado that was the baby version of us. Um, and the first thing that sticks out to me the most is that she both struggles with human communication, but is also insanely good at it at the same time. With her peers, she calls them her friends, but then she's relentlessly bullied by them and generally ostracized from them. She keeps trying to make connections with people there, but she just simply can't. And she also doesn't do that social cue of like, lying to say that she's fine or doing basic small talk. She instead will just entirely unload how she's feeling or will ask a weird question. Um, and generally she has no filter. Things just kind of fall out. And I love that about her because same. And also she uses very big words for just a very teeny tiny human um, with some characteristic autistic speech patterns that we have talked before on this channel talked about before on this channel. I missed a word there. But while she struggles with social norms, she's still, as I said earlier, atypically good at hard conversations for someone her age. She's very good at, good at explaining how other people are feeling and why they act the way that they do in response to those feelings. She's also very aware that she's different and she doesn't fit in and she often directly names that. And I think part of why she's so good at naming and handling really big emotions is a trauma response to the death of her parents. But it's also a very like, I have grown up not being understood or understanding what's happening in society. So I have observed enough of these things to connect these dots and put all of these things into words as well. Um, it's, it's, and also like trauma experience and autism experience are just, they're, they're best friends. Anyway, what's interesting about this to me in particular though, is that the really big, scary, overwhelming things like baby getting taken away from Nani or losing Stitch. These are things that she copes with and seems to handle like an adult. Meanwhile, the teeny tiny things like a girl from hula class teasing her, make Lilo explode and punch the little girl straight in the face. Which is also a very common thing in our community. I don't know if that's just like a PTSD, you get numb to the big things because you can't do anything about them and therefore you can't control them and you will therefore exert your control over the teeny tiny things where you have autonomy and that's where the explosions happen because it's where you can find that autonomy. Insert persistent demand for autonomy behaviors here that we've also talked before about on this channel. You know, actually to connect it to the to, to PDA, she is so aggressively autonomous throughout this entire film and that's what we love about her. And it kind of brings us also to the next point, which is that she gets into trouble without meaning to all the time. Part of it is that the aliens are kind of messing everything up, but also part of it is that she thinks she has a handle on things and then those things just fall apart sometimes. She always means well, but she often ends up at the center of chaos by complete and total accident. Kind of in the same way Anne of Green Gables does, which is another autistic coded character, and always just kind of ends up in statistically improbable comedy of errors situations, which I will say 
is something that you read about in books and you're like, oh, this only happens like it's out of control and it's wild because it's in media and it needs to be extra in depth. My life is that. I literally just came, I'm still shaking. I just came back from a comedy of error situation and I don't know how I got myself into it, but I got myself into it and it's a mess, but we figured it out. And yeah, so this isn't just, <laughs> this isn't just like a cartoon character or like Anne of Green Gables, like just somehow finding yourself in such an, an absolutely absurd situation that seems so statistically improbable and impossible, but somehow having had logical steps that got you from point A to point B, but then at the end you're like, how did that even get to that point? That's a real life thing, unfortunately. Anyway, another thing that I love about Lilo is that she has a very strong sense of what is right and wrong and she sticks to that. She holds people to their word and she takes that very, very seriously to the point where she will talk to the Grand Councilwoman of the Intergalactic Council and go, hey, I get that you want to put Stitch in custody, but I pay for him at the shelter and I have the adoption papers. So like under local law, he is my pet. And if you take him away, that's theft. How haven't we talked about this before? Lilo goes to get a dog. She sees a weird creature that is objectively not a dog and she falls in love with it and declares this is her dog now. She also connects better with humans, uh, nope, with animals than she does with humans, both with Stitch and with Pudge the fish. And my favorite, most lovingly heartbreaking piece of this film is that she has to feed Pudge a peanut butter sandwich every day because he controls the weather. And um, the day that her parents died, it was raining. And again, like this ties back to her using her observational skills to try to make sense of the world, to try to exert some sort of control over it even if it's in a very weird in a typical direction that doesn't actually have any control over anything. And this is also one of the reasons why she gets so upset when her routine becomes a little bit wonky, because if one thing is wrong, it feels like the world is slightly off its axis and then things might genuinely go wrong and it just feels icky to her and she can't handle that. And so she explodes by punching a little girl in the face. Also, there are other hints in other lines of the film that Leela follows very strict routines of how her life goes and that she very much likes to follow them. And if she can't follow them, she gets overwhelmed. And then the last handful of things that don't fit into a category, her special interest is clearly Elvis Presley. She studies his social cues and his behavior and whatnot to emulate it, to try to fit in. Also, she collects things. This is a common autistic trait that I can't quite explain, but we tend to collect things, particularly things on the weirder side. I'm trying to think of a weird collection that I have. I have so many collections in this room right now. See, the thing is, is that they're not weird to me, but they're weird to other people. I guess I have a bowl of rocks. I just find rocks places and they gotta come home with me. And so I just collect rocks and it happens. Her collection is uh, photos of terribly sunburnt tourists and it's wonderful and I love that for her. Overall, Lilo is the autistic baby Disney princess. The world did not know that it needed, but it is so happy to have. She is messy and imperfect, but also she is seven um, and she's trying her best in a very rough situation. And given the circumstances, she's doing amazing and I'm super, super proud of her. So let me know your favorite part about these films, um, what other autistic traits I maybe missed because I do that sometimes. What other fun facts about this movie exist? Because I did not grow up with it like most people did. So I don't have that like extra nostalgia impact that other people do. Also, let me know what princess I should do next because every time I put out a poll asking, which one should I do next? Everybody says Elsa or princesses I've already done, which is relatively unhelpful. And uh, for, the, for the record, to put this into the universe, I will not be doing Elsa until I make my deep dive into autism and disability in the musical Wicked, which is on hold probably for at least a year for reasons. So I hear you but repeating it is not gonna make it come any faster. I'm really sorry. I'm aware that she exists. I'm deliberately avoiding it right now because Elsa is just an off-brand, badly written version of Elphaba from Wicked. So I need the context for, anyway, give me another princess. I went on a tangent. Um, give me princesses to do in the comments. If you don't know what other ones I haven't done yet, um, there's a playlist, you can look at it. Uh, tell me lots of things about this movie. I wanna hear about it. You're also welcome to like, subscribe if you want to as well, but no pressure. In the meantime, thank you for listening. Thank you for learning. Remember, it's never too late to start over and I look forward to seeing you, my dear, in the next one.